Cheaters are very cunning people, but sooner or later, each one of them will get caught. As absurd as it might sound, every cheater wants to be caught. This is because cheaters start to feel invincible and make a lot of mistakes, which leads to their downfall. That's how it happened with my unfaithful wife. I learned a tough lesson about how quickly an ordinary person's daily life can fall apart. A few years ago, my family, my wife and, 38 years old, myself, Larry Dragon, 42 years old, and our children, Angelica, 8, and Egget, 6, weren't the happiest group in our Scandinavian county capital, but we held it together for the sake of the kids. Things took a turn when I ran into an old schoolmate, Tom Hall, on a Friday after work at the liquor store. It had been years since we'd last seen each other, and with the store being busy, we had just enough time to catch up. To our surprise, we discovered that Tom's wife, Cecilia, worked in the same office where and had been for the last few months. Tom asked, didn't I see you at our wife's Christmas party? Are you coming to the farewell event for the company's former owners? I told him I'd love to go, but I hadn't received an invitation. Tom looked surprised and replied, of course you're invited. All couples are welcome. Why wouldn't you be? I'll double check with him, but you can be sure we'll see you there, old friend. The big company event was just two and a half months after the Christmas party, as the previous owners had sold their shares to a national investment firm and wanted to thank all their colleagues before transitioning to new ownership on March 1st. The Christmas party had already been on my mind since it marked Anne's debut at her new job, and she had even mentioned feeling sorry that I wasn't invited. She had also splurged on a new, seductive dress for the occasion, looking stunning. However, she came home at 4 a.m., clearly intoxicated and disheveled. Despite some heated arguments, I chose to believe her story about the party and the drink afterward at a friend's house, where she insisted that nothing improper had happened with any other man. Though I had my doubts, I didn't waste time confronting and after returning from errands. I ran into my old friend Tom Hall at the liquor store. He mentioned his wife works at your company, I said. Anne's expression grew nervous. What's her name? Cecilia. No, I don't know her, she replied. He said he knows you, I continued. And he also mentioned that all couples were invited to your Christmas party. So, who pretended to be your partner, and where did you spend the night? Her face paled as she stammered, I've told you countless times, I genuinely thought couples weren't invited. I was new and misunderstood the invitation. So, you were the only one naive enough not to understand a simple invite at your own company? I'm going to find out who took advantage of you after the party, and they'll regret crossing my path. Tears ran down her face as she pleaded, I've explained this to you countless times. It was just a group of colleagues, maybe a dozen of us, at someone's house. A few drinks, a little dancing, nothing that should make you so angry and suspicious. Her story had too many inconsistencies, but without evidence, I couldn't press further. So, I asked, am I invited and reserved for the next company party? Once again, I noticed a strange look on her face as she hadn't mentioned the upcoming event before. Knowing that I now knew couples were invited, she replied, of course, I've reserved us both, but I forgot to mention it. Doubts about Anne's honesty crept into our marriage, and any thoughts of intimacy with her felt pointless. The situation worsened the following Friday afternoon when I took a few hours off to run errands with Anne, who usually finishes work at one. We were both home when the phone rang. Upon answering, I heard car radio music before the caller abruptly hung up, and asked, who was it? I responded, your lover, but they hung up when they realized I answered. My response was intended as a harmless joke, but I couldn't help but notice how she hesitated for a moment before snapping, you're so strange. What on earth do you think of me? It was just an innocent joke, I said. But now, after your extreme reaction, I'm not sure if I went too far. Eventually, she calmed down and spoke quietly. No, you were right. It felt more like one of your jealous moments than a silly joke, but I apologize for losing my temper. I had a terrible day at work, 
and while that's no excuse, I hope it shed some light on why I reacted poorly. At the next party, and chose a less provocative outfit compared to the last time, and her mood seemed far from cheerful as we arrived. The event was held at one of the city's finest hotels, with dinner served at round tables instead of the usual long ones. Sitting with five other couples, it was clear that Anne knew all the other women. I couldn't shake the feeling that she viewed my presence as a nuisance, interrupting her plans for an enjoyable evening. After dinner, while we enjoyed coffee and cognac, her boss, Dean, approached our table for a brief conversation. Noticing that I was seated next to Anne, he commented, You must be Anne's husband. Sorry you couldn't make it to the Christmas party. I replied, I wasn't actually invited to that party, at least that's what Anne told me. Looking at Anne, her boss asked, but all couples were invited. How did you miss that? I added, she came home very late and in a sorry state, so I assumed she preferred someone from the office to accompany her instead of me. Some of the other couples couldn't suppress their laughter, and turned red as a tomato, clearly uncomfortable. Her boss said, I'm not aware of that, before excusing himself. I added, maybe you should investigate. There are always loose ends in every workplace, and began to cry, and I'm sure the other couples found the situation uncomfortable, as they all made excuses and headed for the bathroom. I also went to the bathroom, where I had a brief conversation with one of the other spouses sitting at our table. He mentioned that he and his wife had been seated near and at the Christmas party, and throughout the evening, she had been quite close to one of her colleagues. He remembered and because of her distinguished and old-fashioned last name. I never anticipated that something like this would happen to me, but I know that many naive men before me have discovered the painful truth about their unfaithful wives through some unexpected circumstance. It hit me like a punch in the gut. I admit that I had noticed the spark between Anne and me had dimmed lately, but I attributed it to the natural ebbs and flows that occur in all marriages. I didn't worry too much, trusting that things would improve soon. However, I didn't see Anne at the party, and a colleague informed me that she had left and wasn't answering her phone. When the babysitter didn't answer our home phone either, I realized Anne must have come home and dismissed her. I stayed at the bar, relieved that no one mentioned Anne. Upon returning home, I found her asleep in our bed. The next day marked the worst day of our eleven-year marriage, and I yelled and refused to reveal where she had been or with whom at the Christmas party. By Monday morning, she resumed her work as usual, relieved that none of her colleagues mentioned my embarrassing behavior at the dinner, not even her boss, who evidently considered it a personal matter. However, gossip among her co-workers behind her back was another story. The following Friday night brought an unexpected surprise when and became intimate with me, a marked contrast to her usual behavior. Naturally, I couldn't help but suspect that her newfound interest in our intimacy had something to do with my recent comments about an old lover, and fell asleep shortly after our tense encounter. The next eight days passed without incident, giving me hope that our relationship was improving. However, one morning my optimism collapsed when I noticed and was dressed more elegantly than usual, her hair impeccably styled. During breakfast, she casually mentioned the possibility of needing to work overtime, a detail she conveniently forgot to mention the previous day. I saw no reason to hold back my thoughts, so I abruptly said, do you dress provocatively for overtime? Wouldn't it be better to be honest and admit you're planning to see your lover? Her surprise was evident before she exploded, you're crazy again. You really need help with your paranoia. I think it's best to end this marriage so you can be with your lover openly. I won't stay married to a cheater, that's for sure, and began to cry, and our kids joined in. I started to regret my actions, wondering how they had affected my family. I had provoked a serious argument based solely on suspicions, without any evidence of Anne's infidelity, just a nagging feeling from a sleepless night. After crying for a while, and tearfully asked, do you really want a divorce? I replied, yes, if you're determined to ruin our marriage, we should both move on. I'm tired of being treated poorly. Believe me, I've had enough, and rushed back to our bedroom, and I felt a pang of regret for accusing her of infidelity without a shred of evidence. 
I realized I had acted primitively, handling the situation entirely the wrong way. I should have taken the conventional route of gathering evidence before making accusations. When in return to the kitchen a few minutes later, she was dressed for a regular day. Neither of us spoke, unsure of what to say. I realized that only a miracle could save our marriage. If Anne was innocent, she might not be able to endure the humiliation I had caused her. If she was guilty, our marriage would probably end as soon as I found proof. That evening, Anne shared a story about telling her boss that I had denied her overtime, and he believed her, due to our previous discussions about the party. I should have contacted her boss, but I didn't. To my relief, unexpected help came from the new owners of her company. Their IT specialists conducted a covert investigation into the office's computer usage and found that, on average, employees spent 52 minutes per day on personal matters. The most egregious case involved someone who had been online for 16 hours during the week under scrutiny. The following Monday morning, all the staff at Anne's office were called to a meeting where they were informed of new regulations. These rules prohibited any personal internet use, and the restructuring led to the firing of the four most recent hires. And kept her job, but now had to use the shared computer at home for all her email correspondence. Although the kids had computers, they were not given internet access. I've always had an interest in computer programs, and I felt the game was now in my favor. I was prepared, having set up the computer with a mirror program to save copies of everything she did. Another program would recover anything she deleted. Within days, and created a new email account on our computer in addition to her existing Hotmail address, which she used for innocent chats with old friends who had moved away. The new account received only a few messages, mostly from someone named Happy Lad, along with the usual spam. During the first week, Anne's messages were innocent, informing Happy Lad of her new email address and that she was available online again. Even if she deleted them, her initial response was simply, great to have my dear online again. Now, I was certain that Anne was involved in something, and I had high hopes of collecting valuable information. They were probably using cell phones as their primary means of communication, especially since Anne's access to our home computer was limited, and she knew about my expertise with computers. However, I suspected she preferred email for longer messages. I made the firm decision that if Anne's infidelity led to our divorce, she wouldn't get 50% of our assets. I had worked diligently to build a stable financial foundation for my family, and I was determined that no scoundrel would benefit from it. Consequently, I methodically implemented the plan I had devised to safeguard my finances. Being the sole owner of our home, I secured a substantial loan under the pretense of investments without end signature. To my surprise, the bank approved my request without hesitation. The next day, I informed and that I needed to travel to Italy for final negotiations on purchasing a new machine for work. She expressed no objections or questions, as similar trips had been part of my routine before. The next day, I visited a local travel agency and purchased an expensive flight to Malaga, Spain. I also had them book a hotel room in Gibraltar, a small British territory notorious for its role in money laundering within Europe. I made sure to reserve tickets for my trip from Gibraltar to London and back home. As expected, and didn't contact my workplace to inquire about my three-day absence. Upon departing for my trip, I boarded a local bus from Malaga to the Spanish border town of La Linea and then headed to Gibraltar. However, I didn't engage in any illicit activities. Instead, I spent my time visiting the famous rock and its surroundings. The next morning, I took the earliest flight to London and then returned home. Throughout the trip, I mostly used my personal credit card, a choice that would make tracking easier if necessary in the future. For now, my only recourse was to monitor her activities on our computer. Unfortunately, there wasn't much of value at first. I had only found one message from Happy Lad expressing his loneliness in a hotel room and wishing for Anne's presence to comfort him. She hadn't responded by email, which led me to check her cell phone while she was in the shower. However, as usual, all messages had been deleted. 
Finally, I succeeded in intercepting her next email, which contained valuable details. Hi, dear. Sorry for my absence. I've been busy with important clients up north, far away from you. While your partner was in Italy, I missed our meetings terribly, knowing you were waiting for me every night. But there's good news. Next Wednesday, I've cleared my schedule and have the whole day free in the city. The only thing I have to do is go to the dentist from 9.30 to 10.30. We'll have the rest of the day just for us, you and me. And please take at least that day off from 11 a.m. onward and spend it with me. Yours, Frederick. Now that I knew his name and profession, I held on to a faint hope that she would use this letter to respond, and indeed, she did. Dear Frederick, I will gladly take the afternoon off. How about a romantic dinner at your place to avoid being seen in public? I still feel Larry's suspicions, so this exceptional meeting seems like a reasonable way to keep our secret. However, I agree that this moment will benefit us both. I've often thought of you and look forward to our special day together. With love, Anne. With great satisfaction, I rented an apartment and paid a year's rent in advance, anticipating potential complications with the authorities during my divorce. Locating a seller named Frederick in our city turned out to be a challenge, as both the name and profession were too common. I suspected he might be affiliated with the same company as Anne, but without more clues regarding the date and time, I had little chance of tracking him down. In today's world, many people heavily rely on cell phones for communication, and evidently, and and her lover Frederick were no exception since I found no further information on our computer. The day before Anne's anticipated event, I finalized my preparations, draining both my personal bank accounts and our joint account, funneling the money through covert channels. I also arranged for a van with heavily tinted windows. To my surprise, and behaved completely normally on her big Wednesday morning. There was no seductive outfit, no special hairstyle, nothing to suggest she was anticipating a meeting with her lover. I began to hope she had cancelled the whole thing. However, despite my efforts to hide my anxiety, and noticed my worried expression and asked, Are you okay? You don't look well. What could be wrong? I replied, I'm fine, just a little worried about some minor issues I need to resolve today, but everything's under control. I was worried because you looked so pale. Don't worry, I'm fine, she said. By the way, it would be great to have lunch together today so we can discuss some important matters. Once again, she looked uneasy as she responded, I'd love to, but I'm sorry, I can't. I already have an important work meeting scheduled for lunch. Tomorrow works better for me. I looked at her directly and said, I understand. Priorities first. Once again, she seemed to lose color from her face. I hoped she had reconsidered any undesirable plans she had for the day, but I wasn't fine at all. The fate of our family hinged on what she intended to do in the next few hours. I feared this might be our last family breakfast and that our plans for lunch would be indefinitely cancelled. And left for work, taking our youngest to preschool while Angelica went to school, leaving me alone at home once again. After taking the day off work, by 10.30, I had strategically parked outside Anne's workplace, positioned to keep an eye on both her car and the employee entrance. Thanks to the tinted windows, I remained invisible as I waited in the back seat behind the driver's seat. At 5.11, she exited the parking lot and drove to a residential area just outside the city center. She parked outside one of the entrances and went inside. I waited five minutes before calling her cell phone. When she saw my name on the caller ID, she answered, What's up, Larry? I said, You, my dear, are my biggest problem. Your lover is at home and you are supposed to be there with him. I'm on my way to confront him. Get dressed and leave his apartment before I arrive. She sounded worried, but replied, What are you talking about? I'm at work, of course. I responded, If what you say is true, that's in your favor. If not, this won't end well. I hung up the phone and found myself standing in front of Frederick's door, 
holding a demolition hammer hidden in a black trash bag. As expected, a man in his fifties appeared a minute later. Without hesitation, I swung my right fist, catching him off guard and forcing him back into the apartment, and was behind him, pale and trembling. I shouted, get out of here right now. Before she could react, I pushed her out and locked the door behind her. Once alone with Frederick, I unleashed a series of blows until he collapsed on the floor. Under different circumstances, I'm sure a younger, fitter man would have overpowered me, but taken by surprise and fueled by my rage over my failed marriage, I prevailed. He lay motionless on the floor as I wielded my demolition hammer, smashing every valuable item in his modestly furnished one-bedroom apartment. I realized this place wasn't his actual residence, so I took Frederick's cell phone and certain documents containing his address and personal details. Outside, and kept ringing the doorbell and shouting, don't hurt him, please don't hurt him. I opened the door and dragged her back into the apartment. It's yours now, you unfaithful woman. Do whatever you want with him, I don't care about either of you. And recoiled in horror at the sight of Frederick in the wrecked apartment, tears streaming down her face as she pleaded, Please, Larry, let me explain. Please listen. I silenced her with a sharp shut up and walked out to the van. As I reviewed Frederick's documents, I discovered that he worked as a salesman for the same company as Anne, but lived with his family near the national capital. That explained his modest accommodations in our city. Frederick had destroyed my marriage, so as the Bible says, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I had only one course of action left. First, I called Anne's parents, informing them that I had to work late and that Anne was dealing with personal matters, requesting they look after our kids after school. They agreed. Then, I turned off my phone and set off on a two-day leisure trip in a rented van. Unfortunately, I can't reveal the details of that trip in this narrative, as I'm aware that this forum has a significant audience in Scandinavia, and innocents could face consequences if I disclosed anything. Upon returning to my hometown two days later, I turned my phone on to find numerous messages from Anne. My only response was a text informing her that I had started divorce proceedings and that it was my final decision regarding our marriage. I spent the rest of the day moving my belongings from our house to my new apartment, leaving copies of the divorce papers on the kitchen table. It was evident that Anne's affair with Frederick had been ongoing for several months. If it had been a one-time drunken mistake after the Christmas party, perhaps there would have been a small chance of forgiveness. Alternatively, if what I had revealed during our last family breakfast had caused her to cancel her plans with him, Frederick might have avoided the severe beating he received the next day. The following day, I went to work as usual and was somewhat surprised that Anne hadn't contacted me. The only call I received about Frederick was from the police, who wanted to speak with me. Since both they and I were busy, we scheduled a meeting three weeks later. After lunch, I called Anne's mother, who informed me that the kids were staying with her for a few days and that Anne had mentioned she had no objections to the divorce. Three days later, Anne called me, furious because our finances had collapsed. She blamed me for ruining Frederick's home and threatened to sue me. I explained that the lost money could be recovered, but the loss of our love and the destruction of our family were irreparable, and was not satisfied with my response. Three weeks later, accompanied by my lawyer, I visited the police station. It turned out to be a cordial exchange and my lawyer raised no objections during the discussion. The police accused me of severely injuring Frederick, rendering him unable to work for two weeks and of causing damage to both his apartment and his home. I refuted all the allegations except for defending myself when confronted by my wife's desperate and enraged lover during the interruption of their meeting. It seemed the police were doing their duty without going out of their way to incriminate me. Clearly, they had no sympathy for a disloyal wife and her parasitic partner. I wasn't too worried since even if I were found guilty and ordered to compensate Frederick, it wouldn't provide him with any benefit. The verdict would simply grant him a legal avenue to collect from me, but if I lacked the means to pay, that would become his problem, something the legal system wouldn't address. To my surprise, and called me and proposed a meeting about our children at a restaurant. I accepted the invitation, and we managed to have the meeting civilly. 
During our conversation, and shocked me by admitting her affair with Frederick, which had begun shortly after she started her new job, and explained that during a restructuring in the sales department, she had been working as Frederick's secretary, which led to growing tension between them. Lunch at his apartment turned into a more intimate encounter. Despite their occasional meetings, opportunities were limited since Frederick made infrequent visits to the main office. When Frederick's wife couldn't attend the Christmas party, they seized the opportunity to spend almost the entire night together, and expressed regret, calling her involvement the biggest mistake of her life, and assured me that despite the affair, her family and I had always been her priority. She claimed her love for me remained unchanged, even during my accusations of infidelity. She said they had planned to end the affair the day I confronted Frederick, and that she had imagined rewarding me by becoming a faithful wife again. With Frederick's wife leaving him, they had planned to live together, but had offered to end the relationship if I gave her another chance. Unfortunately, I replied that the pain was too great. We then agreed that she would have primary custody, but the children could visit me as often as they wanted. After some hesitation, she asked about the finances, and I noticed tears in her eyes when I admitted that I had lost everything in reckless investments, explaining that this was the cost of our divorce. To me, losing my family was far more significant than any amount of money. Once again, she promised to reunite the family if I accepted her apology and took her back. Her expression soured when I expressed my preference for having an ex-wife over an unfaithful wife. Before we parted ways, I warned her that hiring a lawyer to recover the lost money would be costly and futile. The following Monday morning at work, when my lovely secretary, Sarah, arrived, I immediately sensed that something was very wrong. She was wearing sunglasses, and when she took them off, I noticed a bruise around her left eye. Her right eye also appeared red, as if she had been crying all weekend. Initially reluctant to talk, Sarah eventually revealed I'm now a single mother. Surprised, I asked what happened. She explained Daniel and I are over. I was hit for the second time, so I'm filing for divorce. A man who hits his wife twice will probably continue unless she leaves. I had always seen Sarah and Daniel as the epitome of a perfect couple. So I asked, what led to this? What pushed him to such drastic behavior? Sarah explained that jealousy was the cause. The first time he hit me was after I danced a passionate tango with a charming South American man at a wedding. Though it was an innocent dance, Daniel was so furious that he hit me. I forgave him at first, but I warned him that the next time would be the last, and he assured me it wouldn't happen again. But here we are. Astonished, I asked, and why did he hit you this time? She responded, because he blames me for the breakup between N and you. I couldn't understand. How could it be your fault that and slept with that bastard Frederick? That's beyond me. Sarah explained, because he believes that you and I had an affair. I was so surprised that I exclaimed, you and I had an affair. What are you talking about? I didn't even inform you about that. How could I be part of something like that and not know it? She replied, neither you nor I knew about this so-called affair, but apparently we should have been the first to find out. Daniel heard rumors and believed them blindly without confronting either of us to find out the truth. Instead, he hit me with his fist. I still couldn't believe that someone as decent as Daniel had become so irrational, pushing his beloved wife toward divorce. I had always admired Sarah, but I never made inappropriate comments or advances toward her, even though I preferred her over and if I had to choose. I asked, why didn't he come to me directly? I've stayed faithful to and despite numerous temptations over the years. Sure, I envy David for being married to the woman of my dreams, but mere envy doesn't translate into dishonesty. Where did he get those baseless rumors and why did he believe them blindly without seeking the truth? Sarah explained that some of David's acquaintances had heard the rumors and passed them on to him. How could he be so foolish as to confront us with fists instead of talking to us? She tried to laugh, then commented, now that your dream girl is single, your place or mine. I returned her a reassuring smile and replied, I have no intention of holding back, 
especially now that what you've offered today is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Although we joked about embracing our newly discovered single lives, we both understood that this was a pivotal day that could change our paths in many ways. The tension gradually built, leading her to take the afternoon off work. After work, I returned to my apartment, but I wasn't expecting her arrival. However, at 6 p.m., she appeared at my door with a small travel bag in hand. Sarah commented, just in case you're serious about our date, I suggested she rest while I prepared dinner. As we sat on the couch after the meal, talking about our failed marriages, I reassured her every time she asked about the possibility of reconciling with him.